I'm uh, Torsten Wiesel. I'm uh, a neuro neurobiologist, and I like to talk about some discovery that David Jubel and I made uh, uh, some oh, starting out 60 years ago. And this picture is from when we started out. David Jubel to the left and me to the right. And we had just finished our medical studies and decided to leave the clinic and try to see if we could not advance our understanding of, of the brain by doing basic research in neuroscience. And we, we were very, our attitude was very much the one of an explorer. We, we just had tools in our hands and, and we were interested in to understand how, how we visual images on the retina, how they are being processed by the brain. So we can see things in detail and color and depth. And so that was, and no one really had at the time studied cells in the, in the visual cortex. So it was a vir virgin territory. And so we, we had no hypothesis, no real uh, theory how it should work. We just wanted to uh, using the method of recording from single nerve cells in the brain, then try to see what, how the system works. It's a simple, simple-minded idea. And we were very fortunate uh, in that we were able to come to the laboratory of, of, uh, of, of Stephen Kuffler, uh, who uh, was uh, already, at the time he was, working, his lab was in the basement of the Wilmer Institute at Johns Hopkins Medical School. And it was a simple uh, setup, and we got a room uh, there, and uh, the reason why we were happy in the basement was that Steve Kufler was a, he was a brilliant person in his, in his work, and his main interest was in synaptic transmission, how the synapse, the connection between nerve fibers and cell, nerve cells work. It's a very fine, and that was his passion. But since he was at an eye institute, he also uh, started, did some work on the retina. He recorded from single retinal ganglion cell. And, and this was a fundamental work that I will dis describe in a bit, uh, that really laid the foundation for the work that David and I uh, carried out. In, in started out in the basement. So uh, David Jubel, he 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 uh, uh, was Canadian, and he had uh, and he um, had already uh, uh, shown his talents uh, uh, in in neuroscience. He was working in Mon McGill University for a bit, and then he he. Uh, during this period, he um, developed the microelectrode, the tungsten microelectrode, which was really a major uh, advance. And uh, I had heard him uh, giving talks about he had recording from uh, uh, wide awake cats uh, using a very uh, elegant technique that he developed himself. That actually later on was uh, the model for uh, the the work that now is still is going on, the recording from awake, wide awake monkeys in particular. And he, he was uh, very skillful in terms of instrumentation. He had a lathe in the lab and could build his own equipment. So I, th I think uh, for me uh, to have such a, not only a skillful technically, but also brilliant uh, mind to a uh, person uh, to work with was, uh, I think, my great fortune in my scientific career. So the combination of uh, Kufler and David really set me off in a very uh, good start. The, um, the, um, this is a 
picture of, of uh, the, the micro lecture. You can see the thing coming in from the right uh, and uh, coming close to a nerve cell. The nerve cell is stained here with a uh, silver stain to show the cell body and the processes. And it turns out when you put the electrode close, as you can see here, to the cell body, you can record the all and on action potentials that cells, nerve cells use to communicate with each other. So this all and on action potential travel down or to a long process called an axon that then goes to another nerve cell and is uh, uh, communicate with that. So the frequency, the ax action potential is, is an all and on signal that changes in frequency and depending the, the, the information that's conveyed from one cell to another is through the changes in the frequency of the firing of the cell. And uh, once the signal comes to the end of the axon, the terminal, uh, the, the transmitter released and uh, you then have a, an analog transformation of the digital signal. So, so that's how the nervous system works, the digital signaling of long or short distances and then uh, an analog uh, who would process uh, signal perhaps from thousands and thousands of, of individual inputs to the cell. So, this sounds very complicated, but it turns out that, as you will see in the recording that will show, that it, you actually can receive information, useful information by this recording. And just to give you a little bit of a background, let me um, show you um, the um, uh, system that we used. Uh, in our studies, initially, we were, in, the, as I said, in the basement, and we had, we, we had very little money, and we, the only thing we had available was this blackboard and also an old uh, slide projector we could put in. And, and uh, then we had an amplifier, and the animal was sitting behind David. I could look at the screen, and then we project um, images onto the small papers that you see uh, tagged onto the blackboard. And this was then our method of, of stimulating uh, the receptive field, the area of light sensitive area of single cells. It might be easier to uh, understand this by looking at this uh, graph. This is a human head of which we, we only worked on anesthetized cats and monkeys, but the system is very similar uh, in man and, and uh, particularly in. Uh, in the monkey, and so here you can see the um, uh, the eye, and the the person here is looking at the screen, and you can see the squares on the screen, and the eye projects then to the relay nucleus, the retinal ganglion cells project, and then these relay nucleus project to the to the uh, to the visual cortex. Uh, which is um, the two circles. So the first circles are the relay nucleus, and the big circle is uh, the primary visual cortex. And David and I, we spent about 20 years uh, trying to understand how this uh, beautiful structure work. Um, now, the the um, one thing it's important to remember that it give even if there are there are a million fibers coming in from the eye to the to the large relay nucleus, and then there are hundreds of millions of cells in the primary visual cortex. But even if there are these large number of cells, you can still, by looking at one cell at a time, you will, as you will see, you can learn a great deal about how the system works. As, uh, some people have said that David and I, we broke the code about how visual information was processed from the eye in, and then by the brain. Uh, so, we are, I now like to, to uh, so, uh, so keep in mind that a given cell can only see one of, uh, of the, the square, uh, what we call the light sensitive area or the receptive field of a cell. And uh, 
so you can see that here, you see the, the horizontal bar. So a single cell can see that, which we call then the receptive field, the light sensitive area. The, um, the film you're going to hear, uh, it sounds, when you put the electrode close to the nerve cell for the action potential, the all and all signal, it's, it's an amplifier connected, so you can hear a plop. Uh, when the cell sends its signal. And it's the frequency of these plops that you will hear that indicate the signal. So the, you're now going to hear the signal from one single nerve cell, first from, from the relay nucleus uh, and then from the cortical cell. Another thing you need to know is that when Steve Kufler uh, recorded from retina ganglion cells, uh, he showed that uh, they responded very well to small spots of light, but not to big spots, because they have a, a, a sensitive center and an antagonistic surround. And so, so by stimulating a big spot, you antagonize the cell as well as exciting it. So it was not as effective as you're stimulating the center. Now, David and I found that the cells in the real nucleus here have the same properties. They like small spots, but not big spots. So, uh, so and then you will see uh, when you record from cells here in the primary visual cortex, we found that they don't respond to small spot of light. It was very frustrating. And it was only by chance we discovered what you will see in the movie in a few, in a second. So first, in the movie, you will have a recording them from the single cell in the latter geniculate body. And then without transition, you have a difference in the pitch of the sound when you record from the, uh, the cells in the primary visual cortex. So, so here is a stimulate now in the center of that square, which is the receptive field sensitive area of the cell. And you can hear. Uh, a strong response. Okay, now here you can see then the cell responds very well to a small spot of light. We make the spot large and it's less effective, it's not as crisp as before. And the reason is that you can show here that you stimulate here the surround is antagonistic, you shall stop firing, and when you turn it off, it fires an off response. Okay, and so. You can see how this antagonism uh, function by contracting. Have a big spot, you contract it to a small spot, and the cell fires because you take away the inhibition. It's just showing the center surround arrangement that Kufli was the first uh, to show in the retina ganglion cells, but this is geniculate cell. Now we go uh, just to show that this is a circular, symmetric kind of organization of the receptive field. And to show that we have this bar moved across the receptive field uh, in different orientation. And you can hear that there's no real difference in the frequency of the impulses from. We're still only recording from a single nerve cell in the relay nucleus. Now we have suddenly a pitch change, and you can hear that. And now we are recording from a single cell in the primary visual cortex. And we have map out the light sensitive area, the receptive field of a single cortical cell. Uh, and it's very, you can see the blackboard we had before is very simple, and you draw them on this piece of paper, the line outlines. Uh, and the size of the field is it's, it's, it's a little bit bigger than indicated here, and the orientation is a little bit more counterclockwise. But in principle, this is actually an experiment that David and I carried out some 50, 60 years ago. And we just wanted to have it documented, because at first people didn't believe us that it was true that cells had this property that you now will see. Uh, this, some cell, this cell responds a little bit better to left or movement than right, and some cells they respond only to one direction, and other cells uh, prefer one over the other. Or equal. So this is the critical point coming up now. Keep in mind, we are similar the same visual area in the cortex, but this cell doesn't see a horizontal bar. You can only see a bar along the vertical. 
So this is nature's amazing feature. And they, by asking and exploring, we, nature, the brain told us about this trick. Next, we just show a, a, a simple paintbrush, just to show, to show you how, how, how uh, strong and simple this system is it, to detect any orientation of any contour. So, the, um, I, I'd like to go back now to, to uh, this diagram, just to point out that within the, within the uh, receptive, the area, uh, the receptive field, the light sensitive area, uh, the cell you just saw um, uh, prefers sort of close to vertical orientation. Now, when David and I first discovered this, uh, by chance actually, it wasn't because we were clever. It just happened that the contour of an orient disorientation happened to pass by, and, and we say, oh, what does this mean? Because we couldn't activate the cell by spots of light. So David, who was very, he rushed down the hall and called on all our colleagues to come and say, look what, what we have found. And so everybody came and were amazed, like we were about the specificity that cell who responded for in one orientation over any other. But within this square here, uh, the, there are many, there are other neighboring cells who prefer a different orientation. In the drawing here, we have a, a, a horizontal, and there are other oblique orientation. Perhaps there is a representation of 20 different orientations. So, but the cell, all these cells are, will see the same little area. So you have to think about our visual system is parcelated into small light sensitive areas. And then it's not until you get into high visual areas when these areas come together, you have bigger areas of light sensitivity so you can see the whole, whole, uh, whole world. But the initial step in the processing of visual information is this parcelation of images. And the idea here is that these cells sensitive for an orientation of a contour are the instrument used by the brain to uh, visualize, to rec make it possible for us to perceive any object. This slide is from a book by the late David Marr, who, um, who was, a, he liked the idea about, and he was more of a model builder, and he, he, uh, he said that uh, if you look at the teddy bear and you have these cells sensitive to contour, orientation of contour, and he drew here to the right, uh, the, uh, the, uh, here is a vertical, uh, the oriented cell preferring and up on top of the head. So you can actually draw the, the, the teddy bear uh, using these very simple cells. So that's, that was the, uh, that was the concept that, um, that uh, uh, it's like having a Lego set and you can, and you can look upon these cells as, as in individual pieces that then the brain can use in order to depict any object uh, of interest. Now the funny thing happened when, when we published this paper in the spring of 1969, uh, not this figure, but the fact that the visual, primary visual cortex sensitive, the cells there are sensitive to orientation of contour. Uh, I received a note, or we received a note from uh, J.C. Young, who was a very prominent neurobiologist in Britain. And he said, uh, Torsten, uh, this is very, uh, very nice, but there's nothing new. And then he sent me this picture of uh, the Van Gogh's uh, self-portrait. So you can, as you can see, Van Gogh used oriented lines in order to draw his picture, and other artists have also used similar ways. And so you can ask, maybe artists have a more uh, intuitive understanding how our brain works. And they obviously don't realize it, but and we don't either necessarily, but this is one way perhaps that we should like to bring the arts and the sciences together that 
by working together, you may learn from each other. So the um, so this this was um, uh, the the one discovery. The when we started out in the September 19, um, 1958, we uh, discovered this, uh, orient, the orientation of cell sensitivity, specificity of, of cortical cell to orientation after three months. And so we quickly wrote a paper uh, that then published in the spring. The point with, to come back to this slide is that to remind you that these discoveries of, of critical importance for our understanding how vision, how the visual information is coded, was done with very simple, but two young guys using very simple tools. And that uh, one, one like to inspire young people to, if you have an idea, to just find out what you can do and then go ahead and uh, try it out, and then once you find something work, you can get the resources and, and become, uh, uh, build a proper laboratory, which we did. So David and I continued to, to work. This, as I said, took a very short time, and, and later um, uh, we spent 20 years together. Uh, David was supposed to come, as I mentioned, one month, uh, one year, while his lab in Mountcastle was renovated. But we got along so well, and uh, so we uh, stayed together and collaborated for 20 years. And during those 20 years, we, we did uh, study the cortical architecture. We studied, uh, showed that, that the orient cells with similar orientation are grouped in columnar organization in a very beautiful way. And the two eyes work together in a very precise way, also in a columnar fashion. And we could show also that the development of the visual system, what is we are born with and how that can be modified by the environment. So this is a long story, but uh, the, the fact that uh, we, we um, had the resources on time, but I just started out very simply, I think is, is uh, to remember. Of course, we, we then, uh, in 1981, we were told that we had won the Nobel Prize, so this is just a, a, a press conference in that context, and we both looked happy. Now, David uh, continued to stay at Harvard for until uh, 2013 when he, uh, when he died, uh, and uh, I, I still feel uh, strongly that uh, uh, I used to call, we used to call each other scientific brothers, and that's, that's true. We became scientifically very close uh, and uh, enjoyed each other scientifically, whereas at the same time we had our own personal lives. So, but it was a, a real uh, brotherhood type of scientific brotherhood situation. Oh, I still miss the guy. So, thank you. <laughs>